Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Michael Libowitz, a Canadian economist, socialist, and written extensively on Latin America and on real socialism. Well, I'm very happy to be here, and I hope I can be, uh, you know, in indicate some things of interest to you. We were talking about Venezuela just a while back regarding the kind of protests that has come up there. Now, a part of the or a, one of the underlying issues, of course, is the economy. So, do you think currently Venezuelan economy has some serious problems which it needs to needs to address? Without question. I would separate that from the protests that are going on, which are very similar to the protests you know, that occurred in Chile. Um, this is the right that wants to get rid of the government, having lost on the electoral sphere. The electoral sphere. Um, and so that portion of the, 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 the opposition, which um, didn't want to go to elections, wanted the old presidential election to be declared, re refused to, not to acknowledge it, uh, that portion of the, of the opposition has now activated students primarily, students from the private universities, rich students, etc. And those demonstrations that you see on television, etc., are largely occurring in the rich neighborhoods. Uh, they don't occur in the poor neighborhoods because the poor, so far, are you know not attracted to this, and it's been said, and it was said by many opposition people that I read on their websites that um, in fact this was a gift to to uh, Maduro because people were getting concerned about the economic issues and and might have been attracted to an appeal of the opposition, but they cannot possibly identify with these the car burnings, the barricades, etc., and not to speak of the barricades which when the police come to, um, to uh, dismantle them, they're assassinated. That is certainly something that happened, but it is at this point marginal. Um, with the exception of the state of Tatra, which is a very serious problem, it's always been characterized by many paramilitaries there, um, and it's been an opposition um, area, although it did elect a, a Chavist governor, um, who was, and the whole thing began with attacks on, on his uh, dwelling, his residence. But this can go so far, it can't go very far, I would say. By itself, it would fizzle out. But there is this underlying serious economic problem that didn't originate with Maduro. It's been there for quite a while. Um, and I would attribute that, all, people will, will have different reasons to explain it, but I would attribute that to, to, to a very significant extent to an overvalued currency. And that overvalued currency um, goes contrary to, it has the effect of preventing the realization of some of the goals of the Bolivarian Revolution. Um, among them, in particular, the desire for food sovereignty, which is written into the Bolivarian Constitution. Uh, Bolivarian, you know, how do you get food sovereignty when you have a vastly overvalued currency and so much cheaper to import food than to produce it in, in the rural areas and bring it to the cities? Uh, similarly, how do you diversify the economy um, when you have a situation in which you know, it's easier to import manufacturers, much easier, than to you know, produce them locally. Even if you try to subsidize local manufacturers or subsidize local agriculture, you can't fight that kind of situation. Now, that's been around for a while, um, and that overvalued currency. And um, it has, I think, been a serious problem in that did not begin with Maduro. It's been, it's been building. Um, but it was added to very significantly um, by the way some of the actions of the government um, in beginning last April. And that was the mechanism for releasing U.S. dollars was one in which um, there was a, a, a agency called Kadivi, which would effectively allocate the dollars at the official rate of 6.3 bolivars per dollar, U.S. dollar, uh, to importers to take them, to bring in the imports. For some reason, and I don't know what the, the thinking on it was, they reduced the amount of dollars made available uh, through this mechanism, official mechanism. So not surprisingly, there was still a high demand for dollars you know, um, by potential importers, and so they went to the street. Uh, one would say at one point, well, the street rate is 10 dollars, 10 bolivars per dollar, it's compared to the 6.3. Uh, so this 
this was going to be a problem. But then they contracted the amount of dollars of dollars that they were releasing, and the problem gets more and more serious. Um, and I would su suggest that may have been a factor around the time of, of the election of, of uh, Maduro. Um, but then, you, so you, you had a situation, though, that, that built over last year to the point where uh, there were some real flagrant, you know, uh, illegal operations happening. Importers who would get their dollars at 6.3 and then price as if they got their dollars at the street rate. Um, and one of the most dramatic cases was w with the importers of, of, uh, of electronic goods. And so the government, um, and this would have been, I think, in November, the Maduro government moved very decisively against this by saying this was, you know, uh, cheating. This was wrong, that they, they got the money at the 6.3 rate. They, they had to price at the, as if they paid the 6.3. And so they basically opened up the stores to force them to buy, to sell to people at that fair price. Um, and that then was very popular. It was very popular, not only among Chavez, who are happy to see real activity occurring against you know, this inflationary tendencies, but also on non-Chavez. They were happy too. You know? So that was a decisive you know, uh, action. And I think that it probably significantly influenced the elections in December, the municipal elections, where, you know, which, in which the Chavez did very well relative to the opposition. That, that blow to the opposition's hope for an electoral victory, where they were hoping for this to be the mandate that forced Chavez, uh, Maduro out. Uh, well, the problem, though, you know, continued. And th the first few months of this year, the, that gap grew and grew. Um, so at one point it was um, 6.3 was the official rate still. They introduced a kind of auction, which uh, was under the name of CICAD. I can't remember the, what that stood for, um, in which they released certain amounts of dollars um, you know, through an auction process. And that meant, and the rate settled at around 11.3, the, the official rate. It didn't affect the street rate. The street rate was still high. Um, and so it, the street rate actually went to $80, 80 bolivars per dollar, while the official rate was 6.3, and while the secondary little market was 11.3. Well, they've opened it up completely now. They've now made an entire change um, called CICAD 2. And CICAD 2 now releases the dollars, more dollars, on a daily basis for auction. Um, and it will be, and Petavesa, the oil company, will participate in this process. And now this is meant to, you know, really increase the the rate officially. It's a it's devaluation, something that should have happened a long time ago. Um, and how it will work and what will be its immediate impact is really unclear, because one of the things that uh, it, you know it's only starting today. You know, so um, we'll have to watch closely what rate emerges out of this this new auction, and what does it do to this to the um, to the uh, street rate? Because more and more dollars pumped into the economy is clearly going to reduce the demand for it on the street. So essentially, without a devaluation, if your currency is overvalued, it's very difficult to support local manufacturing as well as local agricultural production. So why wouldn't the government? really devalue an overvalued currency? Do you think because a part of the impact would be felt by the middle class in terms of ex imported goods which they would buy, those prices would go up? It's not only the middle class. One of the things that has to be understood is the, the, the standard of life of, of the poor has enormously increased. And, and their consumption standards are modeled on those of higher income. And so they are a major market for many of these imported goods. Um, why did the government not do this? Well, first of all, this is not a, there's not a unique factor here. It's known as the Dutch disease. When you have a very substantial export product, the tendency is to raise the value of the currency. And raising the value of the currency tends to then uh, um, you know, effectively squash all these uh, alternative forms of production. It's happening in Canada right now, uh, that, that very kind of problem because of the growing focus on exporting things from the tar sands and, and those kinds of that oil export and manufacturing is suffering in, in, in Canada. So the Dutch disease is part of the factor, but part of the factor, one of the factors there, but there's also the whole problem of what is going on in the minds of those, you know, establishing policy. Why didn't they 
devalue. Now, there was a p time when they devalued annually. You know, every January or February they would devalue, and then they would, you know, announce uh, an increase in the um, in the minimum wage in order to compensate, you know, for the inflation that was associated with that. Um, I didn't know. I could never figure out why they stopped doing that on a regular basis and let the problem get worse and worse, you know, um, and not respond. Now, the devaluation and the inflation one has to put in context. You know, it was very high before Chavez. Uh, so, you know, th th if you look at the chart, you see very large, uh, serious inflation that, you know, is often not mentioned by the international media, of course, which is not is really the national media, the national opposition media, because that's who gives them the feeds, the television feeds, etc. Um, so the only rational explanation I've ever heard for maintaining uh, an overvalued currency and not devaluing, and one, one economist you know, explained this to me, but I never got details on it. He said, well, the opposition, many of the people in the opposition have large amounts of dollars outside the country. Um, and if you devalue, you suddenly are giving them a gift, you know, to, that they can bring back into the country. Um, and so that, I mean, what that makes, there's rationality to that, but I think it, it's, it's also a question of national pride. We don't want to, you know, show the weakness of the economy by, by devaluing, et cetera. And devaluing what well, made so much sense. Because it's not only what it means in terms of the structure of the economy, it also has significance in terms of the budget. Because when you, you know, Petavesa sells oil in dollars. The more you devalue, the more boulevards you get, and therefore you have this money to spend in the national budget, you remove deficits, etc. So uh, it's, I've been fr very frustrated over the continuation of that policy. Um, and I think, I, I hope that they can deal with the immediate inflationary effects by importing more goods through the state um, that will, you know, um, protect people against the inflationary effects. Um, I think that uh, my own sense is when you have this mechanism that they had before, channeling out you know, the money to importers, um, it is, you know, th that is a breeding ground for enormous corruption because the importer who gets suddenly this advantage of these cheap dollars will pay back, you know, the person who's assigning the dollars, you know, to him. Um, and in fact, there was an estimate, I can't remember the exact figure, that 30% of the money went to briefcase companies. They didn't really exist, you know. So there, corruption is fed by that. Um, and while, you know, the, the, State sector is not necessarily known f by itself for being absent of corruption. Um, at least, you know, you would have a different mechanism uh, there if the state really controlled the exports and the imports. So the current position of what you call SICOR 2, trying to auction the dollars, is in some sense a first step towards devaluation. It, it is a, a effective devaluation. They'll keep the 6.3 for uh, purchases of, of, of necessities medicine, etc. But otherwise it would really get devalued for large parts of the economy in that, yes. in that way. Yeah. Um, and one of the problems also which, you know, when, is that when the response of the government has been in the past to reduce to when they devalue to then because of the potential and, and real inflationary effects has been to increase the minimum wage, it doesn't affect the people on contracts. Um, because people, you know, organized workers on contracts don't automatically get that same increase at all. And one of the proposals I had made in doing a paper at one point for, for the trade unions was the, uh, the argument that they had to have what was called a COLA, a uh, cost of living adjustment built into their contracts so that it, they also benefited from the government's you know, problem, the, the inflation that, that came from devaluation. Bolivarian government, Venezuela has been really the linchpin of the Latin American architecture, alternate economic architecture that's been, that they have been trying, particularly because right earlier the United States really controlled Latin American economy almost entirely. Now with this alternate structure emerging, do you think there's potential of really being able to get free of the American stranglehold? Alternate institutions could come up in some kind of local integration at the Latin American level could come up, particularly with new governments now uh, coming in. El Salvador recently, other uh, pro, I wouldn't say 
socialist, but definitely progressive governments of different kinds coming in Latin America? It's, it's hard to say, in the sense that um, one of the key moves, it wasn't, wasn't a structural change you know, in, in the Venezuelan economy, um, and, and it's always important to, to know that Chavez, you know, when elected, was not a socialist. He was very explicit that he looked for the third way, neither capitalism nor socialism. He wanted a good capitalism. He learned that capitalism didn't want that. Um, so, but one of the first things he did, he did two th things on an international sphere. One was to revive OPEC, to go around the world to all the oil producing companies and bring up oil prices as a result of his actions. The other was to lead in the opposition to the free trade agreement for the Americas, the ALCA. Um, and in doing that, uh, and he was the only voice you know, against that initially, that was a real check to U.S. hegemony you know, in, in the whole continent. Um, and one of the things that, you know, that was like one of the steps you know, uh, it, of Chavez in sort of um, orchestrating a new Latin America. Um, and you know, it took the form of, you know, we could see it in terms of the, that you know, um, the OAS is a shell of what it was before, because you know, uh, Latin America has its own institution, which excludes US and Canada, but includes, very importantly, Cuba. Um, so there has been this, this new development, uh, it, not simply uh, the, the one most closely associated with Chavez, which was the ALBA project, bringing together a number of countries such as Bolivia, um, Nicaragua, Ecuador. It may be in there now. It wasn't initially. Yeah, um, it came in later, but Ecuador is yeah. definitely So part. that was a, a project, but there's also always been a competing, another, a second project, which is Mercosur. Yeah. Um, and these are different projects because the ALBA was uh, based on solidarity um, and, you know, mutual relations of respect, etc. Mercosur was like the European common, common market. And being in both, for Venezuela, I always felt was a difficult situation because how do you develop your own industry when, you know, you have Brazil's industry next to you, you know, and, you know, how do you compete? And does, that would violate the Mercosur conditions if you try to protect and, and, and stimulate your own industries. Um, but, so the U.S., the combination of the nationalism, you know, uh, coming from some countries in, in, you know, in the Mercosur project and the ALBA project um, certainly was a, um, a kick in the face to U.S. imperialism. But the important thing is U.S. imperialism never sleeps. It's always there. Um, it's always engaged in subversion. Um, and it always has a new project that will uh, attempt to accomplish what it hasn't accomplished in its old efforts. And one of the things that we have to notice at this point is this new project on the Pacific coast of, of, of Latin America, uh, of South America, well, Latin America, um, and that is you know, related to the Trans-Pacific you know, partnership, which is this horrible, it, every, every one of these national agree, international agreements gets worse, you know, and this one will completely, you know, protect international uh, uh, intellectual property rights in such a way that you can't do anything, you know, uh, to develop your own country. Uh, it will force, and this is Canadian municipalities are very concerned about this, it'll make completely illegal any attempt to say buy locally from local producers. No, that violates everything. Uh, but the project that is emerging now in, in, in the Pacific coast of Latin America has been uh, this trade agreement, this co combination that includes Mexico, Colombia, um, Chile, and Peru. Um, and this is a split, you know, a, a potential split in that unity of Latin America, and the United States is fostering that. Um, so I think that, you know, we have to recognize the imperialism may be checked at various points, but it never stops. That's good, because if it stops, then of course you'll have a problem that a lot of people will not know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Jokes aside, yeah, okay. do, do, do you think that with Chile's elections now, do you think that some of these things may change? Well, from the information we have, um, Bachelet has proceeded as if there were no movements that had pushed, you know, for the, for her election, um, and that, um, you know, it, it, you know, from the cabinet um, posts, 
um, that she's assigned, um, it doesn't, it's not going to happen spontaneously or automatically. Um, the only thing that will drive Chile in the direction of some of the left governments of Latin America will be mobilization of the people who are, you know, uh, will be very disappointed by the fact that uh, it, she's not carrying through on her pre-election promises, etc. What's happening in Peru? Do you think that is firmly on the right-wing side as of now? As of now, yeah. Um, the uh, Olante, is, I think it was? Uh, Olante Humala. Uh, Humala. Uh, he was, um, you know, he presented himself initially as a supporter of Chavez. He came out of the armed struggle at one point yes, in time. Yes, and his, his father, I remember him, his father being interviewed saying, his brother was the real revolutionary, you know, that I think his brother was in jail or, or so, but in any event, yes, but he certainly got pulled into the whole neoliberal project, um, and there's nothing that distinguished him, for example, from Pinero in, uh, in uh, Chile. Which is a really something which is uh, very surprising, because we all thought with Humla coming in that there is going to be a shift in Peru like in other countries, but that hasn't happened. No, no. And Colombia, do you think there is any possibility of it shifting? Because it's no longer as, uh, what shall we say, as much of an enemy to Venezuela as it used to be a couple of years back. Seems to have toned down some of its opposition and trying to reach some kind of at least business relationship with uh, Venezuela. Temporarily because what one has to recognize is the split in the, in the Colombian oligarchy between the old traditional wealth represented by Santos and the new wealth which is more closely linked to the drug trade and the drug interests. Um, and Uribe, you know, uh, who is the latter, represents the latter, is still as opposed and still, you know, uh, active in trying to overthrow any, everything that's happening in Venezuela. And so the struggle between Uribe and Santos, Uribe's not running, but he has a candidate running, is revolves around a number of issues, one of which is the negotiations with FARC, which are currently taking, back, taking place in Cuba. Uribe is opposed, absolutely opposed, to any negotiations with FARC. Santos is basically uh, pinning his hopes on success in these negotiations. Uh, but if, if these don't work, and that's the, the challenge to Santos, to be flexible enough to have to deliver something, uh, if these don't work and Uribe people come back, then all of this is gone. Uh, we're, we're back into an encircled Venezuela. And Santos did make some moves to breach the uh, divide with Venezuela, some amount of compromise to have some trade going. So all those things would be, would be gone. Yes, I would say so. Do you think there is a Latin America, there is a possibility of the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, uh, which is really being opposed in large, large number of countries, getting through? Or do you think that more or less the continent will hold as it did earlier? It's hard to say. My general motto, and I have it on my Skype you know, count, is pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Only struggle is going to resolve that. So we look forward to seeing what happens in Latin America, particularly right now with the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, which is the linchpin of what I would say is a much bigger onslaught on the people all over the world, because not only Latin America, other countries get affected. And effectively, it's all with the European Agreement. This almost takes probably half the world's economy in its orbit, yeah. and which would really make things much more difficult for other countries who are going to be outside. It's an international you know, assault and it requires an international response. Thank you very much, Michael. Hope to see you again, as I said earlier, to Martha in India again. Thank well, you very I much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.